Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Haig from Southern India. Wanted to do a series of videos on Jacques Ellul, one of the greatest philosophers to discuss the problem of modern technology and probably the biggest influence on Ted Kaczynski's work. In fact, now as I'm writing the book, uh, Philosophy of Ted Kaczynski, I've noticed that it can actually pair one by one um, a number of statements that Kaczynski makes in his body of writings with um, similar statements that Jacques Ellul makes uh, within this book, The Technological Society. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that Kaczynski plagiarized those ideas, but I am saying that the influence from Ellul to Kaczynski is undeniable. And in fact, I think Jacques Ellul has a number of insights which are so idiosyncratic and so unique to his way of thinking, which even um, you know the other great philosophers who've, who've thought about technology um, really reached uh, rather different conclusions than Ellul did. And that's why I think it's such a, an important work to discuss. So in this video, I'll be talking about the entire book uh, technological society, or in French, la technique. Um, and it is a very big book. So I will try my best to um, cover a kind of general sense of the book, but I will um, definitely recommend you to go out and buy this book and read the whole thing. Um, it's a very dense, but very delightful read. So um, Jacques Ellul is interested in this book in something that he calls technique. And he talks about technique rather than explicitly talking about technology as, um, as, as often as he is able to do so. So for Jacques Ellul, technique is kind of also more useful than the word technology because when most people say technology, they really mean machines. And this is something which I admit, I, I, you know, I even kind of made a mistake with when I wrote uh, my second book, Being an Oil, talking about Ted Kaczynski, was arguing that, you know, for Kaczynski, technology is machines. Um, and this is an insight which actually Kaczynski shares with Ilul. Both of them understand technology to be irreducible to machines. Now, it's certainly true that machines are technology, or rather that machines show us what Ilul will call technique. But it's wrong to say that the word technology, as most people understand it, being synonymous with machines, is a satisfactory um, word to communicate what he's trying to get at. Rather, for Jacques Ellul, the idea that our world could be defined as a world of machines is something that he'll also call into question because machine might be the most obvious example of technique, but technique is irreducible to machines. And one reason that that's the case, he says, is that um, technique has actually outpaced machinery and it is spread from the realm of production to which a more sort of traditional, I guess maybe, you know, capitalist critique of the problem might, might uh, limit it to that. And said now technique encompasses all activities. Yet he still thinks that the machine is useful as a, something of an insight into uh, like a technique purified. But he argues that the, the mechanization that you see embodied in the machine is something which technique spreads to everything that it touches. So therefore, we have ourselves, in a certain sense, been mechanized by technique, and that we're now forced to live in inhuman urban, and even worse than that, suburban conditions as a result of the spread that technique has achieved from the realm of production to every area of life, and from machines as such to really everything and everyone at this point. Therefore, he says critiquing capitalism is not going to be satisfactory. Technique is a much broader phenomenon than um, either capitalism or socialism. In fact, technique is also broader than science in that modern science is not the origin which produces technique as a result, but is itself technique. Now, this is something Heidegger also mentions in the question concerning technology that he says, we, we usually think that there was a scientific revolution in which we built up all of this knowledge through objective analysis in, in science. And then we just put that to use with engineering. But he says it's actually the other way around. Modern science is modern technology in that technology defined as something other than a set of machines. This is an idea that Ilul shares with Heidegger and Kaczynski actually forces you to acknowledge that. Therefore, the question naturally arises, how can one define technique? And his answer is that technique is not uniquely modern. And let me just make sure that this is streaming real quick. How can one define 
Okay, it looks like that. I'll get back to those comments in a second. Thank you. How can one define technique? Technique is not uniquely modern. And he says even prehistoric humans have techniques for accomplishing activities with a sort of teleological orientation towards survival. So um, even so-called primitive people have techniques for gathering firewood. They have techniques for hunting. They have techniques for foraging and preparing the foraged and hunted materials for consumption, etc. And yet he notes, uh, notes that this uh, scholar named Mouse still made an error by defining technique in terms of manual activities, even including what's done by prehistoric humans. But it looks as this is unsatisfactory because technique is now an overwhelmingly intellectual phenomenon. It's one that can no longer be understood through the metaphor of manual activity. It's rather something in which um, machines um, and manual labor, uh, it, it's one that deals with uh, machines for which the manual labor, labor definition is simply inapplicable. And the extension beyond um, merely manual activity um, levels of interest also is evidenced by the fact that now we overwhelmingly have intellectual technique in the form of things like chemistry and physics, something that Heidegger and Kaczynski also agree with, but also in things that manipulate humans, like psychoanalysis is a great example of that, sociology, propaganda, all of this, he says, is examples of technique. And therefore, one has to avoid the Marxist idea of reducing all technique to its sub teleological orientation towards economic gain. He shows that a lot of modern technique actually has no explicitly economic motive. Boy Scouts, for example, is an example of social technique, but there's no orientation there towards making profit in a monetary sense. Okay, Therefore, productivity has to be abandoned as the sole standard for evaluating or critiquing technique in that much of what is created by technique actually serves the purpose of destruction rather than productivity. You can't, for example, understand the hydrogen bomb through this economic orientation towards production because the whole point of the hydrogen bomb is destruction. Therefore, if we're going to define technique, we could start by maybe saying that a technical operation is something in which you have teleology guided by method. And the main thing that defines this is you're replacing spontaneous forms with technical forms in order to maximize efficiency and adaptability. So you have this shift from this type of unconscious act, which is sort of the result of a spontaneous movement of a living thing, to rather replace it with reasoned, clear, and voluntary concepts. Okay. It says, although we have reached the historically anomalous point at which technique has encroached upon a universal mechanization of everything, it is still important to emphasize that technique has, as I mentioned, the type of prehistoric origins that uh, are all too easy to miss if you limit it to the present era. And he says that the surprising thing um, that you will find if you go all the way back to prehistory is that magic is actually kind of the best example of um, pre-modern technique. And he says that magic is technique in the same way that the most prestigious modern sciences, uh, because there you have the same coincidence of teleology overlapping with strict forms. Okay, And in both cases, technique is an intermediary between the weak human and the frightening alienated power of nature. Okay, and He says that magic is kind of the first technique, but is no ignored by modern analysts due to like the materialist bias that we have of not taking stuff like that seriously, but also because of the sociological problems. There is, for example, a lack of um, definite progress within magic, which you don't fight with modern technique. Modern technique, for example, is um, something that has a track record in which it can demonstrate its progress. You have progress from 18th century physics to 19th century to 20th century. We're still sort of making progress. Um, it's extremely expensive the more progress you make due to the low hanging fruit principle, but you still have this track record in which, in which science is progressing. Technology is progressing. Um, it's uh, unthinkable in the 
eras of the huge supercomputers of like the 1960s that every Tom, Dick, and Harry would have a more powerful machine on their lap, as Tchaikovsky says. But that's, you know, admittedly progress. Um, but you don't have that with magic. You have instead a type of disappearance of it when the tradition dies out because it's largely passed on from person to person. And that's why with this sort of lack of material record also, we ignore magic. But he says magic really is still technique. And that's sort of where the history of technique might be thought of as beginning. And he says that what you have if you progress you know, up into ancient history is you have with the Greek era something of a rather untechnical era in the sense that you do have an explicit um, separation for the ancient Greeks between technique and science. The idea for the ancient Greeks is that what would be done as science is for the purpose of contemplation rather than application. The ideal of Aristotle that uh, uh, thinking philosophy has no need for any extrinsic factor to allow it to take place, which is why it's kind of the highest path towards happiness. Other pathways towards happiness, Aristotle says, are dependent on other things. For example, if I am hungry, that's something that I kind of depend on the existence of, you know, a chicken, if I want to eat chicken, or existence of a sack of potatoes to satisfy that need. But with philosophy, Aristotle says, all you need is your mind, okay? this That certainly is the ancient Greek separation in which science for them is not done as technique, okay? But with ancient Rome, you do see this kind of sophisticated imperial development of technique, but there it's mostly social technique. And the interesting thing about it is in ancient Rome, you have a type of social organization oriented towards an economic approach towards power. The idea is if you minimize the use of explicit force within the empire, you have a more technically rationalized system. And it's interesting that whereas many people will um, be quick to blame technique on the West and on Christianity or on Western Christianity. It's actually rather silly to do that, Jacques Ingle says, because the 4th to 14th centuries were precisely the era of the breakdown of Roman technique. Even what appeared to be big technical innovations in, say, medieval architecture were actually motivated by religion rather than by strictly technical factors. Therefore, the closest thing you actually get in the Middle Ages to technique as this type of uh, pure rationalization that he mentions is scholastic philosophy. But scholastic philosophy is purely abstract and formal. And the joke about scholastic philosophy is it thinks questions like how many angels can dance on, on the head of a pin is a serious question. And although that's a bit of a caricature, it is true that people like Thomas Aquinas wondered how many species of angel are there and concluded that since you know, um, individuals of a species are distinguished from each other by materiality. In other words, I'm a different human from you because of a different material instantiation of the same species that you are. Well, he says with angels, you can't do that. Therefore, every angel is its own species. And that's something which um, was the closest you get to technique in the Middle Ages, but that's a far cry from the kind of technique that we have today. And he says that the Protestant Reformation is not necessarily more technical either, in that Max Weber largely exaggerated the effects of uh, the Protestant Reformation for capitalism. If you read uh, Max Weber's thesis that in Calvinism, you're no longer saved by ritual or by a priest. So now you have to uh, trust in grace that you're free, but you still have to sort of demonstrate that you're one of the elect by doing good works. It's the sort of paradox which Weber claims leads to the capitalist work ethic um, in Protestant rather than Catholic countries. But Shaky Lul says that's a little bit of an exaggeration. He says what actually happens is the centuries after the Protestant Reformation are among the least technical of all centuries. He says that in the 17th century, for example, even a scientific treatise was more like an open-ended reflection than something like rationalized technique. And if you read like Pascal in the 17th century, um, who was a you know great mathematician, if you read um, uh, Paul Say by um, Pascal, it seems like a rambling sort of set of disconnected short little ideas. It's a delightful book, don't get me wrong, but that's what the mathematicians in the 17th century were writing like. Um, so that's just a reflection of, you know, pun intended, a century of reflection 
on the mind rather than an attempt to build these huge systems is one way it's put. And he says that something changes in the 18th century. The 18th century is when you have the explosion of technique. And Lula is decidedly not a peak oil thinker in that for him, the change was not discovering a new energy source, which he designates as coal, um, but rather it was a new attitude towards energy in general and towards the world in general, I should say. And the reason that Ilul says it's not just that we got access to coal, it's that we were able to maybe approach this thing called coal the same way we were approaching the world itself. It's something which he says cannot be subordinated to anything else. This change in attitude uh, cannot be explained by any more primordial motives. You cannot subordinate it to economic gain for reasons I already mentioned. You cannot subordinate it to epis uh, the epistemology of science, as I already mentioned earlier. You cannot subordinate it to fossil fuels. Um, it's something which he admits we do not have the answer for why this happened. But that's his entire point is technique is the base um, concept here rather than any of those. So at any rate, social changes fall from this. You have traditional social groupings that break down because they're a hindrance to the spread of technique. This is something Kaczynski mentioned as well. We, you know, um, you know, things like the traditional extended family are actually a hindrance to technique in which the rules of social advancement within a corporation would rule out promoting your brother just because he's your brother, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, traditional religious communities largely break down as a result of technique. And he says what you get is urban crowding, rural displacement, family breakdown, and all of this evidencing the need for social plasticity as a condition for technique. And what you have in chapter two with the characterology of technique is to find out that to an extent that uh, there were techniques in pre-modern times, they existed under far greater spatial and temporal constraints. You had spatial restriction to a local area. You had temporal limitation in which centuries were required for a technology developed without rapid progress. It took centuries, for example, for like, you know, the guilds of the Middle Ages to really perfect the kind of craft that they had. Um, and he said that this allowed a greater diversity of lifestyles over many different locality. Also, technical deficiency of the tool was actually kind of a good thing because it required the individual to develop his or her subjective abilities more to make up for the lack within the tool. In addition, the individual had freedom relative to the society in the sense that like, you know, back in those days you had things like serfs and you had slaves, whatever, but in a lot of ways, the individual still theoretically could flee from a role and escape in a way that would be impossible today. This is an idea that Kaczynski mentions in one letter in which he says, okay, so you uh, get sick of being a, a slave or something and you run away and become a highwayman. Not saying that would be an easy life, but you could actually do that. Today would be impossible. Everywhere you go, your credit card would be tracked, your cell phone would be tracked. You, oh, by the way, you need money at a functioning bank account to do any of this stuff anyway. So the difference between that era and now is that technique now covers the whole earth. And there's a universal transmissibility of technique in which the pre-modern constraints in terms of locality, in terms of time, those are broken down. Now technique is universally transmissible over the entire globe and the world itself has changed in the process. We have an artificial world that has supplanted the natural world. And the result of all of this, I think, has been a type of increased objectivity of technique that has blotted out any need for subjective interpretation, okay? There's no need if it is objectively true that four is bigger than three for even a subject to exercise choice in an act of evaluation. And in fact, things like that are now just done evaluated by machines anyway. And this leads to a type of ontological reconfiguration of that stuff in which now it simply is, okay? We're overwhelmed with the solidified being of this objectivity. And this is largely built on the way that technique is built on, by definition, destroying spontaneity. Technique has no will. Technique has no consciousness, okay? And we can look at the um, characteristics of technique through a type of uh, uh, rationalization that you might find, I would argue, also in Kaczynski's uh, view of self-propagating systems in anti-tech revolution, almost kind of going back to Spinoza's idea of the rational conditions of possible objects are enough uh, to tell you what something is basically. Um, and he says that one of these is self, um, self augmentation. Okay. Technique has automatic growth built into it. 
that need not be explicitly calculated beforehand and then achieved according to some explicit plan. Rather, this growth is uh, just hardwired into the system. And the laws of this self-growth include a type of irreversibility uh, in which you can't turn back the hands of time of this development, and then a type of uh, preference for geometric rather than arithmetical laws. He says the uh, combinations to cover space take precedence over a type of linear addition of, you know, one successor to another successor, okay? And he says that what happens is another um, uh, uh, fundamental feature of this type of system is monism. You have the whole. There is no dichotomy between technique and the abuse of technique or even the use of technique. Instead, there's no question of throwing away the bad parts, keeping the good parts of technique, as Kaczynski would say himself. What is mistaken to think that uh, technique can be separated from its abuse because there is no use of the technique outside the rational technical rules for using. What is also mistaken to assume technique has the intrinsic teleological goal of benefiting getting humans. Its evolution does not occur with that in mind. It's rather purely causal. And automation, for example, is not merely a capitalist problem. It's an inevitable feature of technique. And the suffering that you see in capitalism is not unique to capitalism. It's not unique to the abuse of any one technology, in other words. It is rather an inevitable uh, outcome of technique doing exactly what it's hardwired to do. And this is because there is only one principle in technique. That is efficient ordering. If it's working according to that criteria rather than trying to benefit man, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. Okay, the fourth one is the necessary linking together of techniques. Capitalism and communism are actually going to be the same in this regard. There is no such thing as one isolated machine. The inevitable result of the interconnection of all these of all this stuff is mass urbanization, global transportation. But of course, urban suffering is going to lead to the, a need for mass entertainment propaganda at the rise of mental health. And what you'll find is a breakdown of locality that will extend even to the neighborhood. You're no longer able to talk to your neighbors due to super specialization in each person's work. Yet strangely enough, whereas in previous eras, technologies belong to given civilizations or cultures, and that is to say the technology of the Egyptians was an Egyptian technology because it belonged to that people. The modern technology is a-civilizational, despite being global. We have become a globalized non-culture as a result. The fifth feature is the autonomy of technique. The development of technical organisms, he calls these like a factory as one organism, rather than it's something um, set apart from the rest to act with the type of um, autonomous um, application for technique. It's something you also find with like the police force. Police force must be a closed off unit from the rest of society in order to be efficient under the technical viewpoint. We must then use mass propaganda to accustom people to the constant presence of cops. And the organism therefore squeezes out the need of individual conscious humans, except in the role of an ex inspector of the machine. Okay. And the social advantages which the uh, system admittedly does sort of produce as a product of all of this technical sophistication is therefore exclusively reserved for the insider. There's no benefits going to the non-worker within the society. And he said this in the 1950s. Now you could actually argue that the advantages don't even go to workers. They just go to a certain class of workers. You know, your six-figure salary, corporate or government employee, then you get benefits. Otherwise, you're left out. Okay, And he says that what happens is if you analyze uh, the, the system, in terms of the analogy of an organism, but think about like the economy as being the digestive system of that. You'll have to examine in chapter three, as he does, the economy overall from a sort of technical standpoint rather than say like a Marxist or something like that standpoint. It's just that it's not enough to make the economic base our focus because economics is itself not the deepest base. It's dependent upon technique. And this dependence is not trivial, by the way. You have agricultural technique for example, as literally a danger to the earth. And techniques effect on economics also blots out personal freedom. The worker as an individual vanishes underneath the company as a type of organism. And he says a technical aristocracy 
is a necessary outcome that a priori rules out any genuine democracy from being achieved under technique. So you have the um, aristocracy of billionaires like um, Mark Zuckerberg and these idiots um, as a necessary outcome. That's not an abuse of living under a technical society. That's simply what you get if you do this. And he says that what you have is, uh, if you really want to understand like economic technique, modeling is an example of purified economic technique. And what you have um, as a result is um, a movement away actually from liberal capitalism is the problem in that he says like liberal capitalism is a concern from the 19th century. In the 20th, it's more appropriate to say that the problem is it's a planned economy. And in this case, profit is not even the only goal. Okay, you got to keep in mind the technique has a type of circular orientation back to itself. Technical rationalization is the goal of technical rationalization. And therefore, political technique in chapter four is going to be more like the circulatory system. Okay? And political technique is going to be an inevitable result of the actualization of what remains maybe an abstract economic technique. If you actually actualize it, you require something like political technique. And technique itself is going to require a powerful centralized state to act as the prime mover of this massive activity. Because even something seemingly beneficent, like hardcore physics research, is something which only the state can foot the massive bill for this stuff. And if you maybe don't only focus on like the, the billions of dollars required um, um, in, in, in scientific research, and just think about something like the electric grid. If you have a huge uh, continental scale electric grid in like North America, you know, in a lot of ways, you need the state to foot the bill to get that stuff started, right? And at the level of needing to have these huge state institutions for technical reasons, capitalism and communism are actually indistinguishable. Both of them, at a technical standpoint, have the same um, have the same sort of outcome at the level of political technique and state. And for the decisions themselves become so complicated due to technical rationalization that even a seemingly powerful person, like a president or CEO, doesn't really make the decision. That's done by an electric, electronic brain. And this is what Kaczynski warns about in the manifesto as well. If we take this far enough, turning off the machines will be suicide. And I think we've literally reached that point now. He was saying this kind of hypothetically in the 90s, but you try turning off the entire World Wide Web for one day today, and you tell me what will happen. So um, for the individual, propaganda is also going to um, destroy individual judgment um, by, in a certain sense, carrying on the same problem you have with electronic brains making decisions, extending over to the uh, coerced inability of the individual to make decisions of any kind. And what you'll find is that order is going to replace justice. This is because order has a clear technical meaning, okay? But justice is an ambiguous abstraction which requires a hermeneutical subject because there is no obvious rational solution. Now, obviously, you could still debate what is justice, you know, in the sort of old platonic sense, like in the Republic. But of course, you're not going to have a, um, a an easily rationalized technical answer to that problem, which the electronic brain can deduce on its own, which is why order is going to replace justice. Therefore, law is going to devolve into a complex of technical norms. It works to cover every contingency to blot out the very possibility of being disturbed in its operation. And of course, we all know that the more technically rationalized the United States has gotten, the more people have actually been um, victim to the um, so-called administration of justice in that you know we have more people in America in prison um, than any country in the world, even though India has like four times as many people, right? And what you find in chapter five, focusing on the cellular tissue of the system, which he says is man, is techniques direct relation to the human. He says, with regard to techniques application to the human, there's an obvious mismatch between thousands of years of conditioning and the environment in which modern humans have to live, obviously a Kaczynski point as well. This in turn requires psychological conditions to be created to supplement the inherent mismatch between the two. And strangely enough, technique is going to beget technique in this way. We need to add in other techniques to act as a shock absorber on the unnatural and disturbing effects that technique already created. And therefore you're going to have massification, blot out community. Uh, previous civilizations took their character from the people in it, but all the people today have just been reduced to mass man bound by technical reasons. And the mass society that results 
is going to result in a situation in which no matter how talented any individual might be, if he or she refuses to adapt to become a, to become a massified person, he or she will be worthless and will be reduced to social rubbish to be thrown away. Likewise, institutions are needed to make this adaptation universal and mandatory. And the main standard for success is whether the conditioning makes the person appear to be happy in an environment that would naturally make them absolutely miserable. Education, therefore, is going to shift from the goal of enlightenment to the goal of straight up conformity. Its only purpose will be to create more technicians. Things like philosophy and using your mind are going to be seen as a waste of time because all we need to do is train more technicians, okay? And unionization is going to be another institution in the service of technique, this time with the goal of organization of labor. And of course, you're going to need propaganda. And he says that radio will fulfill this, at least in his era, by being able to address the masses as individuals. And few things are actually as isolating of the individual as in his era, maybe radio. In the 90s, it was television. In our era, it's arguably smartphones. Because if you're addressed through the medium of a smartphone and feel that you're being addressed as an individual while you're actually consuming a mass program, but millions of other people are also doing, you're still able to fall into the service of technique in which, for example, advertising force a mass of people to perform the same action, such as buying a product, by typing all of them as average. And what happens is that propaganda will drown out your own thoughts and uh, damage your very ability to judge. This is because it does not actually inform you about reality. It merely generates a sham universe which replaces it. And the TV allows the user to avoid confronting his own phantom. In one of the more memorable parts of the book, he says, a worker who's been working a full day under the complete control of the company will finally come home. And if there's enough silence, he'll have to ask himself the question, who exactly am I? Which could not even be thought during the day of working. And instead, the TV allows that person to avoid confronting his own phantom by filling his head with contrived scenarios that require no activity on his part. Therefore, man is no longer the driver behind the wheel of all this machinery. But in a certain sense, a, a certain massified man becomes the object of these techniques. The final result of having massified man as object of technique will be a complete lack of diversity among humans. And in chapter six, which is a very short chapter, which strangely enough, he has these huge chapters for most of the book and the last chapters, like less than 10 pages, um, which is called the look at the future. He, he does mention that scientists can be remarkably naive on social issues. This is something Kaczynski also echoes when he's discussing um, Bill Joy, a uh, billionaire like uh, CEO type of guy in Sil Silicon Valley, who actually admitted that Kaczynski had a lot of good points um, still, when he, wrote, when he wrote about the dangers of technology, um, obviously a very smart guy on technical levels, but rather naive socially. He says, well, you know, the, the main thing we need to do to avoid these problems with technology um, taking away our freedom is we just need to uh, adopt principles like universal love. We just need to love all each other. Like everybody just needs to be loving. And that's the kind of naivety you find also with scientists in um, the 50s that Jacques Ellul mentions. He says, the year 2000 is presented um, seriously in the 1950s as an era with no disease. Okay. There will be routine voyages to the moon. There will be universalized hygienic conditions. And as somebody myself who was in the hospital one week ago for contaminated food here in India, I'll tell you that that definitely has not been achieved. And you'll have completely synthesized food. Now, that one we've actually gotten close. And that's frightening because he mentions that um, bread is so chemically different from traditional bread in his era, like the Wonder Bread crap you buy at Walmart, that basically you had to force humans to forget what bread was to get them to eat this crap. And, um, you know, in a certain sense, that was not a an abusive technique. That was exactly what technique was supposed to do. So let me go ahead and check the comments and uh, thank you guys for watching.
Glad you're covering Elul. His technique is different from Mumford and Spengler's use of the word techniques is similar. Thanks for mentioning Oswald. And uh, I definitely do want to um, study um, some other things of the field. I'm going to do a, a video on uh, Gerjan, um, Jean Gerjan next week. Um, and uh, that should be interesting. And obviously, I want to do a much bigger book, uh, excuse me, a much bigger video on Spengler. So thanks for bringing that. Q says, wonderful and delightful that you do this live. Hey, thanks for tuning in. That's uh, one thing I like is to, uh, to have this participation from you guys. Victor says, excellent video. Thanks. It's worth discussing. There are a few sophisticated civilizations at the time. Why did only the 18th century European become dynamic? That is indeed a mystery. Um, I admit fossil fuels might not be adequate to explain the shift to technique. So Victor says, hence the explosion in STEM education and propaganda at the expense of more subjective disciplines. Yeah, and the irony is that here in India, I think they've actually overproduced on technical uh, people. They've actually overproduced engineers because everybody was forced to go into it. Um, if I may say so myself, as somebody who lives in India and have heard it, had to hear about this. So it's weird that we've actually like overproduced technicians because the more sophisticated the machine gets, the, the less need that it actually has of the inspector. And soon there will be no need for any humans to work on this stuff. It'll be, it'll simply work on itself. So Sam says, can't separate technique from its, uh, from its use or abuse. Very profound. Yes, a great point, which uh, Elul makes in a very brilliant book. Victor says, purely for the sake of technical efficiency, you get powerful technocrats. That's exactly right. And that's why anybody who thinks that like Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, or um, Elon Musk are... Um, people who are, can be trusted to better society at any level, you're out of your mind, you know? And uh, that's my own personal thoughts on this. But anyway, Adam says, thoughts on analytic philosophy, the group of people who claim to have cleaned metaphysics out of philosophy by means of lo logical analysis and positivism. How would you criticize their attitude to philosophy? Well, you, could, you might argue that that's just technique applied to philosophy. Um, in that what is analytic philosophy except a technical rationalization of the system of thought? Uh, Bertrand Russell tries to give us that Percipia Mathematica. Um, and that's that's really just technique applied to thinking. So Victor says, if Lu were alive today, would he see technique as moving in the direction of what China has, the centralized planning, the mass surveillance being better for technical growth? Yes, I think that China is even more technique based today than America. So uh, Oswald says, Lu was a devout Protestant and most likely critical of logical positivists. Yeah, I think that, thank you for that comment. I think he was actually Roman Catholic, to be honest with you. Um, but he certainly was a religious man. And that's what makes reading him breath of fresh air. He's not going to do this sort of, you know, game of saying, well, this, this, is, this is just Western Christianity. Because he showed that the 4th to 14th centuries were actually the breakdown of Roman technique. And the Protestant Reformation actually did not immediately result in capitalism either. So I would guess, so, okay, he's talking to Victor, um, learn to uh, code is the modern dystopian anthem of those who ignore it. Well, yeah, the most depressing thing you'll ever see is somebody do a PhD in a liberal arts field, not get a job, and suddenly they're posting on Facebook that they're learning to program, okay? That is a, it's, 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 um, it's just a sign that this person has fallen hook, line, and sinker for the scam in which, you know, these, um, programming courses at the university, um, which I admit I took some after dropping out of grad school too, they're a complete scam, absolute scam. They teach you outdated info from the 1990s and they pocket your money. And then it's, you know, you're shit out of luck at the end, but it's not their problem because they made their money in student loans. And they're literally just piggybacking on the religion of progress and making out like bandits in the process. And anybody who gets duped into thinking, well, obviously, there's lots of machines around me, so I'll just try to make a living off machines. You're just falling hook, line, and sinker for people who are trying to take advantage of you. Um, okay, so do not do it is what I would recommend. So Oswald says, I thought Elul was Catholic since he's French, but I read his bi autobiography and he was definitely Protestant. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I think that maybe um, Wikipedia perhaps is even wrong. I don't know. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I know more about um, the, the book uh, I read then about his life because I'm kind of actually new to him, but certainly um, he was a Christian of some kind. And thank you for mentioning that Oswald and everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I think that I'm going to get going now and get to cleaning the house and all of that because the uh, house seems to have been a bit overrun with stuff while we were gone for about a month. So 
we've got termites and ants and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So anyway, guys, uh, next video will be actually on uh, myself on Being an Oil by Chad Haig. Let me just show you that. Um, if this is still running. And here we go. Chad Haig's Being an Oil, Volume 1, Peak Oil Philosophy and the Ontology of Limitation. That'll be the next video. Um, thank you, people who uh, have already gotten that. I haven't talked about it because I uh, just got my machine out of the shop. But uh, you can see that uh, it's a 400-page book, which uh, Flowers shared this image of the physical paper co paperback copy available for like $10.99, and there's a Kindle copy for $3.99, and uh, I'll go ahead and introduce you to my philosophy in the next video. So everybody, thank you so much for watching, and let me just do a last check for comments. Okay, looks like a couple more comments. Okay, sorry guys, let's see. Thanks Chad, hey, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, to whatever extent you can tell what percentage of intelligent people understand this. Why isn't this discussed more? Hopelessness, fear? I think it's not discussed more because most people have actually bought into this bullshit that technology is, you know, intrinsically beneficent. Um, so if, you, if you're training to be a, um, a teacher today, they'll not accept in any way, shape, or form resistance to integrating technology in the classroom, okay? Because I, I was studying to be a teacher, and one of the most ridiculous classes I took when I was in uh, undergrad was um, integrating technology in the classroom, in which they basically just wasted our time, um, you know, telling us to somehow find a way to get kids um, using text messaging in their classroom as part of an assignment. And they had no idea why that would be good. They just surrendered completely to, well, I guess the kids are going to have their smartphones on all the time anyway. Um, but people don't discuss it little because most people simply don't buy the message. Most people will say, well, you know, that's an old outdated view from the 1950s by some old, old fogey, whatever, who doesn't understand how this stuff works. And obviously um, the result of, you know, um, uh, of, of constant um, social media addiction has been so beneficial for people's mental health, considering how many people, quite frankly, have committed suicide as a result of social media. Like, honestly, like, if you want to, like, um, look up, like, really some really disturbing shit, look up how many people have committed suicide because of anonymous messages they got on social media. I'm talking, like, middle school age girls. It's pretty disturbing, but we're still, you know, bowed down to these companies and assume that uh, that they're they're uh, they're not only not stoppable, but um, you know that uh, they they have our best interests in mind. So Oswald said, "I hope John Michael Greer got a copy of the book. I really hope so. Um, he was interested in getting a copy, but he boycotts Amazon. So he he was looking to get a copy, but he says, can I get it not on Amazon? Because he he boycotts them. I don't know why. Because I bought like all of my books from him on Amazon, but he still refuses to support them." Um, so I, I don't know, you know, he said he tried to find another way, but at the very least, I, I do appreciate, um, you know, uh, everybody who got a copy um, of the book and, uh, you know, definitely hope that, uh, you know, for those of you who did, you got something out of it. So anyway, I'm going to get going now. Thank you guys. And uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, okay. Something about Martin Luther's theses and Protestant Reformation um, have hypothetical anti-tech revolution. Um, Martin Luther and technology. Huh. I, I like that thesis, actually. Uh, Martin Luther was a um, another guy who was trying to salvage the subject amidst the system, as I discuss. Um, actually, Martin Luther, several works in my book, uh, Being an Oil. Um, Martin Luther was the guy who claimed that we had over-systematized religion to the extent that personal choice had been blotted out by this type of mechanized operation. You pay a certain fee to get your sins um, confessed, regardless of whether you have a personal change of heart. And he was arguing that um, salvaging the ability to have personal redemption is something that um, you'll need in order to uh, salvage the subject. And that was in an era where technical rationalization meant the Catholic Church selling indulgences. Um, you could imagine what he would consider the present day situation. Okay, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, link is on my uh, page, um, channel page, it's channel trailer. Otherwise, just look up Chad Haig in Amazon, be able to find it. And Oswald says, a little book, Christian Anarchy, might go into that. Hey, that sounds great. I, I really want to do more stuff on anarchy too, like uh, post-left anarchy, 
Um, and that's what we'll be talking about John Zerjan next week. Um, so anyway, guys, uh, thanks a lot for watching. Take it easy. Bye-bye.